Breathing in diesel exhaust fumes is like walking into a fire without a mask. Over time, those toxins lead to cancer. Protect yourself with MagnaGrip, the easiest, most reliable exhaust removal system that features a true 100% seal to eliminate diesel exhaust fumes. To get free grant assistance, visit MagnaGrip.com. This podcast is brought to you by Flex 7 from Tenkata Protective Fabrics. Like a trusted turnout jacket you've had for years, Flex 7 Outer Shell Fabric delivers a perfectly broken-in feel on the very first wear. Flexible, comfortable, and powered with the strength of Enforced Technology, Flex 7 Outer Shell Fabric is made to move. To learn more, visit TenkataFabrics.com slash Flex 7. Flex 7, powered by Enforced Technology, only from Tenkata Protective Fabrics. Hello there and welcome to Fire Engineering Blog Talk Radio in this episode of the Professional Volunteer Fire Department. This is the podcast that is dedicated to our great volunteer fire service and we strive to get all of our listeners to embrace the message that developing and displaying and maintaining a professional image and reputation are the duty and responsibility of all firefighters. And we must recognize that true professionalism is not defined by a paycheck. Tom Merrill here. Thank you for being here with me and choosing to listen to this podcast. I truly appreciate it. And summer is here in beautiful Western New York, where I'm from, my hometown of Buffalo, New York. Up until the time of this recording anyway, we are well into our second week of absolutely beautiful weather. This past Memorial Day weekend was freaking awesome. We're into our second straight week of bright sunshine and warm days pool time my pool's open outside barbecues summer is here and hopefully i didn't just jinx it um and it's still that way when this podcast airs but anyway for any of my new york friends or anybody close to the new york area i hope to see you at the new york state cheese conference next week in syracuse new york that's always a great conference with great presenters and such a well put together trade show and this year's going to be no different the conference and education coordinator sue revor she always does an amazing job she puts together just an amazing conference and i think there's going to be over a hundred and 95 vendors there's 34 fire matic classes there's a bunch of vms classes for cme there's hands-on training and of course in addition to the trade show portion there's also the great networking events and opportunities to mingle and talk with like-minded passionate firefighters your peers which is always as you hear me talk about all the time, such an important part of being a professional firefighter and being considered professional in our organizations. Get out and meet people and talk shop because you'll learn a lot and you'll make great friends too. And at that conference, I'm going to presenting, uh, be presenting on Friday, June 16th, uh, my class, Redefining the Mission, the Role of the Past Chief, Making That Transition Easier for Everyone. I based it on conversations that I have had over the years with many past chiefs who admit it can be quite a struggle. And if any of you have been in that role where you were a chief for a bunch of years or even just a few years and then get out, you you probably would agree with that. It is a little bit of a struggle to assimilate back into the ranks after your time in office has ended. And it's certainly tough on the past chief, and it can be hard on the organization, too. And sometimes, and what I'm going to talk about in the class is both sides need to understand that there are things that they can do to help make that transition easier and maybe be a little bit better for everyone. And, you know, it is a common denominator that's shared among every one of us that served in the chief's office. Eventually, your time in that office is coming to an end. Now, some are excited and they can't wait. Some are limited by term limits and understand, okay, my time is up. And there are those that are caught off guard and didn't expect it to end quite so soon. But no matter what the reason, there's certainly a wide range of emotions as they leave office. And I've talked to so many of you about that. And um, fortunately, many 
unfortunately, many struggle to redefine their role, figure out their purpose within the organization. So that's what we're going to talk about because a bad separation can tear an organization in half and even can uh, can create some in destructive infighting. But if it's done properly, the former chief can remain a respected and a motivated and a contributing member. So that's what this presentation is about. And we're going to discuss some model programs that maybe we can employ back home and things to avoid for when it's time for the chief to move on into his new role. So that's what I'm talking about at the New York State Chiefs Conference uh, next week on Friday the 16th. And I hope I see you there. Again, Syracuse, New York, and the conference runs, runs from June 14th to the 17th. Always a good time if you can make it um, and you're in the area, stop on by. What else do I got going on this month? I've uh, been taking it easy as I continue to rest up and heal from my recent, actually, it's not so recent now. It's been about three months since I had some ankle surgery. It certainly stinks getting old, but uh, I'm a runner. That's how I kept in shape for years and removed, uh, had a bunch of bone spurs removed. And I had some ligament damage that dated back to when I was a kid, but my recovery is going well. And I'm just about back to 100% with my left ankle, but then I have to do my right ankle. So, oh, well, what are you going to do, right? It could be worse. So it's prevented me, and I really haven't been looking to do a lot of traveling around the country. I look at my calendar from last year, and I was bouncing all over doing presentations and been taking it easy um, after since the surgery back in March. I was at FDIC, and I got a few other things going on, including I'm going to be doing a nice conference class right from the comfort of my own home office, um, doing a webinar for Columbia Southern and Fire Engineering going to be on june 27th and it's titled professional development for the volunteer firefighter and you can find out more information about it if you'd like to listen in you can sign up please do that um, go to fireengineering.com or simply google fire engineering webcast professional development for the volunteer firefighter and more information will come up to help you register and uh, get ready for that uh, one hour. It's only a quick one hour presentation. And um, I like to talk about what it means to be a professional firefighter because things um, I like to talk about include that sometimes we get distracted or sometimes we fall back on excuses when we're not properly engaged within our organizations, or maybe we don't deliver the level of service that our communities need from us and expect from us. Sometimes we get demotivated and you know, it's it's common. It's uh, people fall back on excuses, and we always are quick as humans to blame others, um, our departments, or some other outside force. But we fail to give ourselves the proper size up, and that's what this presentation is going to talk about. We're going to look at us as individual firefighters, and we're going to talk about all the things that we all have direct personal control over to make us a better trained, a more productive firefighter and member in our hometown volunteer fire department. No matter our department size, no matter maybe whatever limitations the department has or issues or atmosphere, the individual firefighter, us individually, can certainly exemplify true professionalism in all that we say and do. And that's what we're going to talk about on this webinar. And I hope you can join me on uh, June 27th. I think it's a Tuesday. And again, you can get more information if you go... Uh, uh, on fire engineering um, and Google uh, fire engineering webcast professional development for the volunteer firefighter. I'll be doing that for fire engineering in Columbia Southern. And I look forward to you joining me. So I hear from so many of you over the six week time period between my different podcasts. And, you know, so many of you have reached out to share stories and ask me questions. And also sometimes to offer ideas for topics for future podcasts. And I really appreciate it. So um, I encourage all of you, please stay in touch with me. You'll get my contact information at the end of the episode and, you know, stay in touch and pass on your comments, your ideas for shows and stories that uh, from your department, things you're experiencing. And every now and then, Someone will ask me to, hey, can you do more on this topic that you talked about last podcast? Because there's more I think you can talk about. And that's what happened with our guest here again this evening. Last month, we spent about an hour and a half with Jeff Shoup talking about 
engine company operations and the initial deployment of hose lines and things like that. And we both know we barely scratched the surface of things that we could talk about. And it left a few of you clamoring for more and reaching out to me saying, hey, can you bring Jeff back on and talk more about it? So that's what we're going to do. And I'm so glad to have Jeff back on with me to continue this conversation that we started last month. The conversation focusing on the importance of stretching lines correctly and quickly getting water on the fire. And as Jeff likes to say, killing the fire. And as a reminder, Jeff is a retired Cleveland, Ohio firefighter. He began his fire service career there in Cleveland uh, back in 1974. He served 37 years with them. And he's also served as a division chief in the North Myrtle Beach Fire Department down in South Carolina. And he's also been a volunteer firefighter and he's instructed all over the country. And he's written numerous articles for many fire service publications. As a matter of fact, if you're in the engine company operations, you undoubtedly have read Jeff's work. Or maybe you've seen him in the video series sponsored by Elkhart Brass, which is Brass Tax and Hard Facts. That's a great video series that's dedicated to all things engine work and all things hoses and nozzles. And if you've never checked it out, please go to Elkar Brass's website and you'll see Elkar Brass, uh, Brass Tax and Hard Facts video series. And that's what we started talking about last month, all the basics when it comes to engine company operations. And some of you reached out and said, hey, we want more. So guess what? We're going to have more. And welcome to the show, Jeff. Thank you very much. It's a privilege and an honor to be here again. Great to have you back on. And um, I think you said, uh, I wanted to read you something because I think you said you're going to be in the area in not too uh, distant future. So I wanted to share this email I received. As I said, people reach out to me from time to time after the podcast and emails like this really keep me motivated and, and really encourage me to continue doing what, what I've been doing and to bring great guests on like yourself. And this listener from Wisconsin reached out, a lieutenant there, and he says, hey, hi, Tom, I just got done listening to your latest episode, and last Monday, my department trained on initial fire ground deployment, basically from the truck to the door and establishing a water supply. We then had an attached garage fire on Saturday. The garage was fully engulfed and getting into the house, and the guys stopped it, and they even saved a dog. The training was immediately put to the test and it paid off. And he goes on to say, thank you for giving me the motivation to improve our training program with every episode you do. And that's from a fire lieutenant in Wisconsin. And Jeff, how cool is that? It really says a lot about the importance of your message and what we talked about last month. Where, where was I? I was... We were talking about the, the firefighter from Wisconsin wrote in about how he listened to our podcast and it motivated him to put a training program together, focusing on establishing a water supply and getting water on the fire quickly. And they had a garage fire and it paid off. Yeah. Yeah. Those stories are great. And uh, that, that's a that's a great acknowledgement that anyone who really wants to do this, you know, instructing, presenting, working, training, you know, with, with the with uh, fellow firefighters. That's the payoff. Yeah. You know, when you yeah. get stories like that. So I wanted to add that uh, we are going to be up in the Wisconsin area. We're going to be outside of La Crosse, Wisconsin, actually Sparta area at Western Tech College this weekend. So uh, one of the guys who's uh, uh, running the show and also a member of uh, strategic fire training, Blake Deber. And he's been up there for several years. So he has us go up there on an annual basis and we spend a weekend doing work with all the fire departments in that area. So if this guy's in the area, he the the open the open hand and is uh you know there for you. Come on over, see what's going on and have a good time with us. So you know what I'll do? Um what I'll have to do is I'll send him an email letting him know uh for our listeners we are pre-recording this episode. So by the time this airs on fire engineering your training session in Wisconsin will probably be passed. Oh, okay. okay. But I will send him an email letting him know that um, yeah. at when, when we're finished here, um, because that's important to let him know that. So I'll let him know that for sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but okay. um, so, yeah, that really, you know, that, that was a great email. And I get emails like that sometimes with the different episodes that the, the different type of topics I talk about. So very, very encouraging to, uh, 
to continue doing what I'm doing and to bring people on like you with the subject matter experts. So thank you for, <laughs> for being here again. And yeah, you and I talked on the phone about God, we could have talked for another two hours. So, <laughs> yeah. so let's get back into it. And I wanted to start. Um, the, the the listener wrote in about a garage fire. So I thought, you know, last episode we talked about the importance of setting up the engine, establishing the culture, and and training on the basics of stretching the lines quickly and getting water on the fire quickly. Let's take it a step further now and get into some different fire scenarios and maybe some other uh um, maybe uh, for lack of a better word, advanced topics. But since the listener uh, from Wisconsin had a garage fire, let's let's talk about garage fires. I'm sure you've seen uh, your share of mistakes made with garage fires. You know, there's two trains of thought, right? Do you stretch into the house to cut it off? Do you hit the garage hard? Do you maybe do both? And what what does Jeff Shoup say about the garage fire, the attached garage okay. fire? Okay, are we talking detached? Now let's talk about attached. Attached. Okay. Okay. Part of the house. Right. Okay. You see, this is where we fall back on what we say about firefighting. Firefighting, number one, is circumstantial. It depends on so many different things about what you do. And people who want to fall back on hard and fast rules or a black and white environment that says you always do it this way, I don't, I don't, uh, we don't present that. OK, we want people to think about the situation that they have. Look at the building, look at the type of construction, look at the fire. And when people say, no, you have to have that first line inside because that's where people might be. Well, I, I get the idea of what uh, people are saying and so forth. But there's an old thing. And it's one of our old uh, mentors, Andy Fredericks, would say, put the fire out and the problem goes away. So if we have a garage in an attached structure that's heavily involved, blown through the doors or about the doors when we arrive and you're exposing the rest of the house, wouldn't it be a good idea for that first crew to pull a big line and dump as much water as they can into that fire to bring it down now, okay? And while that's being done, then an officer or a firefighter can go in and, you know, give the house a quick check to see if the fire's in the house. And if not, well, fine. We've done a great job of stopping that fire from getting into that house. Now, as more personnel come on the scene, because I'm going to predicate this on three people on an engine, which I think is realistic for many fire departments. As more people come available, okay, you pull the big line, boom, you hit it with the knockdown power. Now a second line being pulled can be your inch and three-quarter or two-inch line, and now you can go inside with that and make sure that also you got the line going inside, then you need tools with it. Because if there's any suspected extension into the house at that point, well, then you might have to open up the walls of the ceilings, you know, to uh, get at the fire and so forth. So right. Finally so, coordinated. Yes, Absolutely. So, yeah, the other thing is, okay, so let's go back to training. So let's take that engine with three people on it. And are they trained to, let's say the engine's got a 750-gallon or even a 1,000-gallon water tank, and those three firefighters arrive, are, have they been trained, that's the question, have they been trained to pull a two-and-a-half and position it properly and just let it play away? Use that overwhelming force from that two and a half and from the right position. And by the way, that there, there again, let's say you got at least a two, maybe two and a half car garage in the house and the fires just roll out there. Okay. Well, position that nozzle to where it's going to get the water into the seat of the fire or the base of the fire and then the doorway to the house. Because three people, you know, they've got a lot to do there in the initial uh, stages of that fire. So positioning of apparatus, stretching of hose lines, calling for water, boom, get water going. Blow it down or kill it if you can. 
So. Have, you, have you ever seen obstacles where the door's still down and maybe the fire's coming, you know, the fire's rolling in the garage, but the garage door absolutely. is down. No, so, absolutely. Right. Yeah. And I've yeah. seen people struggle getting that door open. What's your take on, on cutting it? I've seen TPs, reverse TPs. And, I know. Uh, I know. Here's, here's the thing. You have to look to see if there's a man door on a side of the house, on the side of the garage. Because maybe your engine is an engine and it's not equipped with truck tools or saws or anything like that. Or you don't have the people yet. <laughs> well, there you go. So what's the best thing to do to get water in a fire? Go find that man door on the side of the building or something like that. That a simple axe or even a, a mule kick can usually get that door open. And now you play water into the fire. Bring it down as fast as you can. Because the longer that fire is allowed to burn, the more damage it's going to uh, create and the more intensity it can create also. So mm -hmm. if it's into the voids, let's say you got an attic over the garage and that attic is starting to get going now and it's up against that wall of the living area of the house. Well, see, now, you, now you've got a, a potential for that fire to be getting into that house. So let's get that water going as quickly as we can and then get a firefighter into that house to say, hey, you know what, we got something or we don't have something, but let's get another line stretched at that point. It's a circumstantial thing. Right. Yeah, you know, as you say that, I'm thinking I was just out doing yard work, getting, you know, getting stuff out of my garage. I have a loft in my garage mm -hmm. and at the very top of my garage where the wall meets the uh, ceiling joist. Guess what? It's open to my attic. It's very common go. in my area. And I'm a firefighter, and I've always looked at that thing. I should probably have that finished off. And there it yeah. is. You can see into my attic. It's part of my uh, ventilation for my attic. That's just how the house was designed back then. That is, Easy. More, that is more common than what you think, to yeah. have that horizontal void space going right across the top of the house. Yeah. And, see, and you get a good car fire or something in there, and boy, in no time at all, it could take the attic. We talked about this the last episode about this new problem with batteries, the mm -hmm. lithium batteries and so forth, creating fires, you know, and if you've got them in your garage area, you know, and they're burning and they're burning hot and they get into that, uh, the framing, well, then, you know, you can have a real serious problem there real fast. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What if uh, what if there is no uh, man door on either side of the garage? W what what do our crews have to do? Obviously, it's going to be manpower intensive while they're stretching lines. Hopefully, yeah. there's some people there that can get the door open or at least make a cut. Let, let me throw this one at you, you know, because we've seen this before. And it, it, it's comical in one way and very serious in another. The first line goes in. This garage is rolling pretty good. Okay, rolling real good, in fact. And the people, uh, the firemen pull the line inside, find the garage door from the house to the garage. They open up the door, start fighting the fire. And now something happens, and now the, the fire environment is starting to come into the house because they opened up the door. The fire door or the garage door, like in my house, and my house was built in the 80s, it's a, it's a required fire door. And again, you know, a lot of stuff, like I said, is circumstantial here. The door is doing its job. That's a good barrier to have in place. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, that's why I said there, there's so much to think about right here. Uh, you know, but once that door is open up, especially if your hose line isn't big enough to kill that fire or that volume of fire, well, then you got a lot of products of combustion coming right into the house, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No. Is it worth it to take the time with a saw and cut the uh, garage door open so you can start hitting it then if there's no man door? Well, it, like I said, if your engines carry those tools. If they carry it or a truck showing up or another crew and you it can give that go. order. Right, right. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I could say that, you know, but you, 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 again, it, it depends on what you have. If you got a brick home, well, then you just can't take an axe and breach a wall to get a nozzle in there, or, you know, you, you can try to kick the door in or take a pipe pole, uh, like a six or eight foot, uh, pipe pole and start trying to push the door. You know, if the, uh, track inside is starting to droop and lose its, uh, strength, so yeah. maybe push the doors in that way. Just have that line there with you. 
Mm -hmm. You'll need it at that point. I think it's no matter what, it's it, as quick as you can get water on the fire. We've seen the YouTube videos of of garage fires that maybe aren't acted upon quickly enough and minutes go by and in those minutes as time ticks off that fire gets into the house and before you know it what was a one or two car garage fire is yeah. now a house fire exactly so it's yeah and that that's the thing you know and I, I i i would like to say anytime you have a fire in a garage have it in your mind to expect extension go search for extension you know, whether the fire is getting into the first floor, the second floor, the attic, or, or whatever the case may be, over the main living area of the house. If you don't have anything, great. But at least you went and searched and, you know, searched to see if it was there. All right. Lot and that's the other thing, by the way. You see, here we go. There's so many things at play here in firefighting. You're talking about if you've got a heavy body fire in a garage that's attached to the structure. And you have your engine arriving. You want that engine to have a big water tank to start hitting fire right away. The other thing is engines should be set up. Look, NFPA, we all know about the NFPA, but you people who buy an engine by NFPA only, if you take a look at what the hose bed requirements are for an NFPA engine, 400 feet of inch and a half or larger hose, in a three and a half cubic foot compartment. We're gonna need, yeah, possibly a couple hose lines on this fire right here, especially if fire is getting into other areas of this house and we're gonna go chase it down. So that's why I say engines need to be set up to be, as we call in our, in our group, war wagons, you know, so. Interesting advice. Yeah. But yeah, you got to get water on the fire. A lot of moving parts. So, you know, yeah. you pull up, you got to involve garage. Think about getting water on that fire quickly. No reason you can't use your tank water, even if it's a 500 gallon oh, okay. tank. You know, start knocking it down while your water supply is being established. Stretch yeah. that line. Use the big line if it's going to be a two and a half. Don't be afraid of the two and a half. We'll talk All about right. that in a little bit. And after you get a knock, or even while you're getting a knock, as crews are showing up, get into the house, check for extension, stretch right. a line into the house and use caution. If you're going to open if again, if it's a fire rated door, you know, use caution when you open that, make sure right. you're going to have control of that door because you don't want to let it in the house. Whenever we go out and we do our engine classes, whether we're at FDIC or some conference or whatever, we are big on door control. Because as we, as you're saying, you know, a fire rated door, that's your barrier. Mm -hmm. So if you open that door and the fire's rolling out at you and you don't have your line there, or maybe your line is being stretched to that point, you know, it's just not in service yet. No, you got to be able to control that door. Right. It's doing its job, most likely holding the fire in check. Right, right. Now we'll get that line in place. Now we'll open the door a little bit to see what's going to happen now. Mm -hmm. And then we'll get that line playing in there from that vantage point. Yeah. Yeah. And I like how you quoted Andy Fredericks there, you know, you put the fire out and your problems go away. So, true, so. <laughs> it's so, you know, his work, God rest his soul was so great. And so basic and principle oriented. Right. And again, sometimes we, I think we make things too complicated. Like you said, at the very beginning of this discussion, you know, there's no, you don't, you know, it doesn't have to be, we have to do this. We have to do that. Take a look right. at what you got and realize that dumping some water on that garage fire is going to get a good knock on it. So don't yeah. dilly dally around work yeah. with a sense of purpose. Again, seeing the videos of garage fires with engines pulling up and the crews just seem to be taking their time, waiting for a water supply, not using the tank, whatever it is. And before you know it, it's into the house and they're yeah. losing the house. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what about basement fires? Those are definitely uh, <laughs> an interesting topic and certainly been the subject of a lot of well been on, unfortunately a lot of line of duty deaths associated with basement fires and there's a lot we could say about them yeah yeah um, and again let's let's first determine where this basement is is it in a commercial building or is it in a house 
And if it's in a house, let's you want to stay with the residential structure? Yeah, let's stay with the residential. Okay. All right. So in a residential structure, uh, is it an older structure? Is it a newer structure? You know, is it a sloping property that has a walkout basement? Uh it, how how uh, much fire do you have? What are the conditions? One of the old... Uh, you know what's in the basement even, right? How many times is that throwing us for a loop, right? Well, <laughs> it, it, that's a good point because, you know, if, if you pull up on your engine and you see the basement windows are orange, especially on the street side of the house, and it's an older neighborhood that you know, uh, you've got the gas lines, you probably have the gas meter involved in that basement. Remember, uh, gas meters are made of very cheap, thin pot metal, and they melt away at a low temperature. You know, they're not they're not designed to be fire resistant or anything like that. You know, it's not like cast iron. So, you know, if you have a side door to go in the basement, those steps going down, if you notice as you're going down, everything's going to be coming up at you. So... On top of those steps going down to the basement, if this is a two-story structure, you probably got the steps to the second floor right above you. And see, that's that vertical void or vertical channeling where if the fire is heavily involved in that basement, it can be in those wall spaces or those stringers going right up, and that's how you can get extension uh, in a structure that way. Mm-hmm. So it's it's uh, one of those things, you know. I know I I've run across again. You know, we've all run across people who say, "Oh, we got to get in through the front door. We got to get it through there, and then we got to get to the basement and stop it because we want to go in from this area." Well, again, a fast moving fire, you want to get water in the fire fast. If you got a side door to the house right there, and right there is the basement steps, let's use that. Well, and then seconds line gets to the first floor. If you read Manuel Freed's book, and he would talk about basements, but I think he, uh, there, there was something that got confused in, in some of that stuff there where the, the basement fire in a commercial structure, you know, first line holds the stairs, second line then gets stretched to go after the fire. And a lot of people were thinking, oh, well, that's got to be the way it is. That's the gospel according to firefighting. And it's like, no, 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 no. Uh, we do need to have a line stretched, you know, when a line is going into the basement. But we should get that line into the basement as quickly as we can. And that can be a tough thing to do, depending on where the line is stretched, where it's going into the building at, how many people you have. Do you have a smoke condition right down to the floor? And then the heat coming up with it. So that's there's just once again we talk about the variables of a basement fire. You're operating over a fire. So things like I say, uh, little tip offs like uh, the the basement windows are they orange or are they black? Do you have uh, let's say a two and a half story frame house and you have smoke coming from the eaves upstairs? That's mean it's pushing up that way, and you might have fire on the. Uh, first floor and second floor and heading towards the attic. Mm-hmm. So once again, the need for multiple lines and ventilation, coordinated fire attack. So what does Jeff, what does Jeff Shoup say about if, uh, if crews are arriving, we know we have a basement fire. There's an orange glow in the basement. We don't know how to make access to the basement yet. There's no walkout staircase while things are getting set up, what does Jeff Shoup say about giving it a shot uh, through the basement window to knock it down? If you have to do it to slow it down, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, you've got everything working against you at that point. And again, are we looking at three people on the engine? If you've ever crawled across, open the front living room door, and you started crawling across uh the, the uh, living room floor, trying to find a basement door in, in heavy smoke condition and had your knees burned, that's a wake-up call right there about the intensity and the volume of fire you have right underneath you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the thing, you know. Maybe we better find a different way to attack this fire. And like what you're asking, you know, does this require a shot from a window or the, the uh, uh, side entrance door? 
Absolutely. Why yeah. not look at it as, a, as an option for us? You want to slow this thing down. A lot of basements in my area, you have to crawl through the house to get to the stairs to the basement. There's no walkout. So something to be aware of, I guess, is the heat condition on your knees. I guess right. a, tick, a tick, a thermal imager would probably be a tremendous help in that situation. You know, I just thought of something as yeah. a young firefighter many, many years ago. Um, we had a basement fire. I was probably two years in the department, maybe a little less. I was actually going to EMT training. So I bet you I was less than a, just about a year in the department. Anyway, fire was under control, but I got careless and walked across the living room floor and unbeknownst to me the carpeting was tacked in on the sides but in the middle it went down because the floor had burned away and i walked across and i'm a little guy so i didn't fall through but it was it was a good uh lesson learned because the carpet yeah. gave way and i fell into the void in the but the the carpet wow. didn't i didn't break through the carpet it, it supported me but i did go through that hole a little bit because there was no floor under that carpet and yeah. i can't imagine you're crawling in the fire's not under control yet no you know that and and we've lost coloraine ohio i think is the one that comes to mind those firefighters that we're lost crawling in trying to find the basement i mean there's more stories than that but you know basement fires are dangerous yeah yeah and and, and again you, you just if you have that what does the building give you that's that's what we need to look at you know what is the building giving us uh, to work with here right. and uh, just just slow it down and that's the thing about you know your fire department your culture and things like that you get you, you want to have your guys do the job. You want them to be able to go into attack mode and attack the fire aggressively. Yeah, we all want that. Okay. But there's times when you gotta say, whoa, slow, slow down, hold on. Don't start stretching lines until we know where we're gonna go in at. You know, that's why, you know, when you have a situation like that, heavy smoke condition, you know you got something going downstairs in the basement. And instead of running to one particular door, as we've always been told to do, no, we might have to find another way to get this line into the fire, or we might have to slow it down, like you were saying earlier. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, then figure out, you know, right. I, we've all been to fires where we had to make a quick hit from the outside to get inside on it. Yeah. And pull the line around, pull the line out, walk, walk it around to another point now. And things like that. So keeps uh, keeps the situation kind of fluid and dynamic. Yeah. So let's say we uh, we pull up the we know it's a basement fire. The homeowner told us, yeah, I, I was down there. My basement's on fire and they stretch the line. They're light on people power. There's not a lot of firefighters showing up yet, which is very common in the volunteer ranks. Mm -hmm. So the crew gives it a good knock, let's say, through the basement window. Let's say there's a basement window right by the driveway. They knock the window out. They they put the hose line in there, knock it down a little bit. Now the crew, they get some extra help. There's an entrance for that basement, let's say, right off the garage, which I've seen that a lot, too. So they they yeah. make they make the – there's no walkout staircase. they got to go down and finish putting this fire out. Um, it is true, right, that they are entering a chimney. And when they make those steps to go down into that basement, right. I was always taught go quick because it's a yeah. chimney and it's hot. Well, and uh, you were absolutely right. You, you don't want to play around on those steps. You want to get down to the bottom, to the basement floor as quickly as possible, but under control. I don't want you to go down so fast that you slip, trip, fall, or something like that. And if you lose control of that hose line, remember, in a zero visibility environment like that with that heat, uh, that hose line is also your lifeline. Mm -hmm. So you've got to maintain control of it. So that's why I say, yes, move down the basement steps quickly uh, to get to the basement floor and then get low. And I I'm sure there's there's guys out there who have been in that condition where they've gotten down there and they've gotten on the basement floor and looked and they've seen the orange rectangle. And you know what the orange rectangle is? The heavy smoke banks down. As we open up the basement doors, you open up the doors of the house and so forth, or basement windows, and the smoke starts to lift, you know, maybe six inches, eight inches a foot or whatever off the floor, and you can see where the fire is burning in some cases. And it's interesting. Ah, there we are over there. Okay, now we can go and so forth, attack the fire, because we know where we're going. 
again, stay with that hose line because it's your lifeline. Sure. The other thing is, when you're making your push down those steps, keep the hose line straight behind you. And company officers, you keep that hose line straight. You don't throw a whole bunch of hose in that step thinking this guy's going to need it when he gets down there. Oh, absolutely not. Once again, a straight line of hose. We don't want to create a trip hazard. You don't want the hose to kink. You want to keep the hose manageable. And those are all principles about moving an attack line in. Yeah. We always tell people that hose should be straight at least five to ten feet behind the person in the novel. Whenever you can keep it straight, you keep it straight. So just simple stuff like that and so forth. Very important. Very important. I've I've heard you say that before. I've seen that in your in your videos, keeping that line straight behind the nozzle firefighter, yeah. behind that initial attack crew. Five, ten feet. Excellent advice. Right. Another thing to be aware of, and and I don't know if there's anything you can even do about this, but what about open tread staircases? If the if you're going down those stairs, what if the fire's under the stairs and you have That's... open tread staircases? There's another serious concern. Absolutely, especially in older houses, because you know you have older steps that are made of wood, and once once again we put a bunch of firemen who want to rush down there and so forth, and if you break the steps, you fall down to the basement. Once again, you could lose uh, contact with your hose line and so forth. You wonder where it's at, and out here comes the fire at you because right. it's behind you. Yeah, and that's a very good point to bring up. You might have to once again. Knock that fire down from either the landing at that point. Try to bend the nozzle down to control that environment underneath you and behind you from where you're going down before you make it down there. Yeah, try doing that in the smoke. It's a tough thing to do. Sure, you know, you're trying to talk, you got your face pieces on, you know, you got that give me one of you or whatever, you know, you're and the muffled sounds and the muffled communications of the guys. So, yeah. You're bringing up stuff that really needs to be worked on, especially in departments like this. If you're going to make the push on a basement, if you're expected to be, you know, doing that, drill on it first. Hose line management, communications, do it in blackout conditions to get a better feel for it, you know, before you, you know, start getting out there and, you know, getting getting confronted with it. Right. There's that word training again, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so do you have any words of advice for how to go down the stairs? I, I know some people like to keep their legs one far left, one far right, so they don't put all the weight in the center. I've heard all different, you know, yeah. one step at a time. Anything that you've seen work better than something else? No, I, you know, I, I don't want to tell anybody how to do it. I think it's one of those things. That, and I don't like, uh, but I, I tell you what, I want to make a recommendation that, you, if you're going to flow water, if do it from one location, shut your nozzle down either halfway, bail it so you have that protective cone in front of you, or shut it off if you can. Okay. But don't do it while flowing full. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't want to, I don't like to hearing this, hearing the stories about this guy got tripped, you know, because or slipped or whatever, or lost control of hose line. He had to bend. He got down to the bottom. Remember, there's a lot of times the basement stuff will go right along the outside wall of the basement. So when you get down to the basement steps, if the fire's behind you, you got to do a 180, right? Well, try to do that in the smoke and the heat and the flames or whatever, if that's what you got, and uh, try to control it under those conditions. So that's why we like to say, shut it down to where you can manage it, then make your bend or your turn or your push or whatever it is you're doing. So if it comes time to hit the fire again, get yourself set, do the job again. You know, there's another training topic to work on, and that's if the fire gets behind you, right? Right. <laughs> that's right. not easy to deal with. No. Yeah. Ah. You bend the hose line, you could easily kink it and cut your supply in half or more. This is this is an interesting thing about the new hoses coming out of the markets. I think we talked about this the first episode. And that was, you know, we preach low pressure systems, low pressure, high volume fire attack. Now, the hose is being manufactured now. It allows that to happen. You know, you got to look at what the the manufacturers have out there. 
Use a 50 PSI nozzle, whether it's a solid bore or fog nozzle, I don't care. But you know what the biggest thing about that 50 PSI nozzle? You get as much water out of it as you can. So if you're going to use inch and three quarter, you're going to use solid bore, I, I would say 15 sixteenths. And if you're going to go 50 PSI fog, do 175, 175 gallons a minute at 50 PSI. Give yourself as much firepower and kill power as you can take with you, you know? Mm -hmm. So that thing about kinking, I don't know if I brought it up the last time, but we were working with a fire department, uh, doing some training with this one fire department, good sized fire department too, you know, five engines, two trucks. I think they're uh, growing and so forth. We were doing some training with them and they were talking about over pumping, under pumping. And we said, don't under pump and don't over pump. A solid bore has a design pressure of 50. Don't change it. If the nozzle has a design pressure of 50 PSI, don't, don't mess it up. What we had the pump operator do is reduce the pump pressure so we'd get 40 at the nozzle and we put one kink in the hose line. We took away 25% of the flow in that hose line with that one thing. And think about that. You're going down a basement and, you know, a lot of people say, well, because we're going down the basement and it's hard to manage that hose, we're going to pump at less pressure. And now a kink develops in your hose line along the way. You cut your flow down quite, quite considerably and that's mm -hmm. your safety and that's your efficiency at that point. Right. So it's something to think about for sure. Yeah. Um, now, one of the procedures my department has implemented for basement fires, been this way for a while, actually, I mean, since I got in 40 years ago, is we always taught once that crew goes down into the basement, you get a second line to the top of the basement stairs as soon as possible, if not even before they go down there. And that line doesn't leave the top of the basement stairs. And if that line has to go down, a third line gets to the top of the basement stairs, so on and so forth. Does that sound like good advice? That sounds like real good advice. And it goes right back to the way we design our engines and we spec our engines out for the hose beds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just, and if they, like we, we even train, if, if somebody, when we, pl sometimes we reenact this, we always have that excited firefighter. So we'll, we'll have a firefighter in training, get excited and say, get that second line to into the house. I see fire. And we train that firefighter. No, you are staying at the top of the basement stairs. If they need another line in the house, that comes from somewhere else. It comes off the truck, comes off the engine. We had, uh, when I was on the job in Cleveland, we had a fire. I'll never forget this because we had a, an officer with us, you know, who was, you know, uh, well, he, we, we had a fire on two floors. And we were the first new engine. We pulled our line in, got, got our fire knocked. And the second engine was just arriving, and they were stretching the second line at that point. We could have very easily, you know, left our position and ran upstairs with the line. We didn't. And that's the whole thing about principles and what expectations should be at a fire like that. Because let's say we go up the stairs, we left our fire that we controlled just to just because we're full of piss and vinegar at that point. Right. You know? Hey, we're not stopping here. We're going after it. You know, we're going to, this is our fire, you know, that type of stuff. Yeah. And they missed something. They think, oh, these guys, you know, the second line, yeah, they don't carry on and whatever, you know, and they're, they're, they're going to be, they're going to be pissed off anyhow. Right. But the thing is, it's like I said, it's the principles that the first line should go to the lowest point and control the fire at that area and stay there. And as fire goes up, then you lay out the other lines accordingly. Right. You know, and like I say, that's all that. That's all the manual freed and William Clark stuff right there. Yeah. So. It takes discipline and training. Yeah. It with discipline comes with good training comes discipline and people know what they're doing. It's a finely rehearsed script right. with some leeway and, you know, for making some alternative moves, but Hit, you, play you, to the playbook. <laughs> right. And and here again, this is another thing we talked about last time. So a lot of this stuff is uh, coming, coming to, well, what, however you want to say it, coming out now. 
And that is that's where your senior people and your officers have to be disciplined enough to tell the young people, just hold on, kid. Okay, hold your position. You'll get your fires as, as time goes on. As you get more time in the job, you'll understand why we do it this way. Right, right. Uh, accountability, efficiency, safety, and go kill it. What you got? <laughs> so let's talk about extension with basement fires. So a lot of times you hear the order get given, you know, we got crews in the basement, we got a line in the basement, we got a line at the top of the stairs protecting the stairs. Third line now makes, uh, it goes into the house checking for extension. How do you do that? Um, like I've seen firefighters look uh, deer in the headlight look when they're told check for extension. Should they be punching holes in the wall as they go up the stairs? I've heard pull the baseboard away from the wall. What What's your uh, advice for checking for extension? Well, there, there, there's there's a couple of trains of thought, you know. And again, if 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 you if if you have that suspicion that fire has extended. You send a line. I remember that from an old chief. Hey, I think there's fire up above us. Okay, get a line. No one will ever fault you for that. So when you get up there and it comes to, uh, to the, well, if you have any visual clues, like any uh, bubbling paint in an older house, you know, the old paint uh, that's been mm-hmm. built up over the years, if you have any brown discoloration, okay, you know, uh, that's another thing that indicate that there's something burning behind there. You're going to have smoke in the house. You're probably going to have a heat condition when you got a basement fire and you've got extension. And so if it's a big spot that discolored and so forth, and you got your tools, remember, have your tools with you. You know, what's it going to take for a two and a half story frame? A uh, Halligan tool, uh, an axe, a six foot hook. You know, those are the tools you need to check for and so forth. Just give it what we what we were taught many years to do, years, years ago to do, and that was give it an examination hole. Don't start ripping stuff down. Just punch the hole through, make it big enough that you can see, hey, what do we got? You know, it's amazing what you might see. Uh, it, it, it's really, I shouldn't say it's a cool thing to see somebody's house burning, but, you know, you make that examination hole. And, or uh, yeah, that uh, hole to see which one. And you know when you see sparks, and embers going up the channel, that's telling you you got something going upstairs now too. Right. And that had got to be reported. So that's why when we go above, okay, like we said earlier, yeah, if I think I got fire, then you send a line and you send a crew and you have to have somebody in charge of that line. So there's where the walkie talkie communication of the fire alarm comes. Uh, engine two to command. Yeah, it looks like we got extension in the wall channels, and we're going to be on the number two side or B side, whatever you want to call it, however you designate it. Uh, better get a crew with a line above. Okay, we're going to take care of it right here. And that's that whole thing about you go to your location and operate there. Remember, you can always put that line in that wall now and shoot that stream up that wall void space right there. Mm-hmm. Okay. And if there is fire up there, then hopefully that'll slow it down for you because that's going to take a while for that other line to get stretched to that point to operate. Right. The other thing, too, again, if you're talking older houses with balloon frame construction. I was just going to get into balloon frame. We didn't really talk about that yet. So let's talk about balloon frame. Well, you get a crew to that attic right away, don't you? Yeah, about you as soon as you can. can. You might have to take the windows out. You might have to open up the roof. Uh, where do you open up the roof at? Well, well, where's the location of the fire in the basement? And that's where the internal reports, okay? So let's say fire in the basement, fire in the attic. So where's the fire going up to the attic from? Did that fire in the basement go to an outer wall or did it go through an inner wall? If it's an older house with an old heating system, did it follow the ductwork up through? And you see, these are the things about, you know, radio communications, aligned to each level where necessary, tools in position to open up, and, of course, the ventilation taking place to uh, uh, complement the uh, engine work. Right. Bay- attic windows, okay? Uh, is there a wind blowing outside? You're not going to open them on the windward side, are you? Because now you're going to have a, a, the, the, the wind push the fire through the attic and fan it. 
and we don't want to do that. So you might have to open up the other side first. So it's all, you know, things that we need to look at, you know. Right, right. Uh, you know, I heard one piece of advice. I guess you could say this is for any fire. Um, it's pretty good advice. I know a chief that one of the things that he trained his crew to do for any fire is to put a roof ladder by the front door. Just by chance, in case there was a basement fire and the floor gave way and firefighters went into the basement they wouldn't have to run back to the truck to get that roof ladder. Now, at least they had it right there at the front door already. So that was something he, he came up with. He, he actually had an incident where a firefighter was killed and they, but they did get firefighters out. Um, and, uh, it was, um, because of an attic ladder, they were able to get some firefighters out, but it took a while to get the ladder from the truck in the position. So he made it every fire. We're going to have an attic ladder sitting on the front lawn by the, by the front yeah. door. I thought yeah. that was interesting. You know, those are the things that are born out of our history. You know, we used to have a jack ladder and rope go into every multi-story building, especially with the flat roof, especially where you have a cock loft. So you need a jack ladder, you need a, uh, a rope to pull tools up, pull hose lines up, you know, to other parts of the building and things like right. that, especially in big buildings. So right. what happened to them? How did we lose those? You know, right. You need to, maybe that's that whole thing about we've had all these studies. Okay. But they haven't told us how to do the job in a principled or more basic way. The more basic you can keep it, the simpler it'll be. Oh, and gosh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So let's talk about, let's say we had a basement fire and it did get into the attic or tell you my story, my department. We just had a rip roaring attic fire last week, last Thursday evening. Um, anyone who wants to see pictures of it can go on our department website, website SnyderFD.com. Uh, the residents smelled smoke for a few hours. I'm hearing different stories as to how long before the fire was discovered. They couldn't find anything until it was too late. And the fire took the attic, uh, raced across the attic pretty good, and it was, a, it was a challenge. So let's talk attic fires. Let's talk about what Jeff Shoup has seen go right or wrong or what makes attic fires go smoother because it, it can have... It can, in my house, my attic has a completely separate door with a walk-up staircase. As you well know, there's houses that have a little scuttle in a closet or a pull-down staircase in a hallway mm -hmm. or maybe nothing at all. We know attics can be finished. They can be unfinished. And if an attic is, if there's one common denominator, people put anything up in an attic. So there's a lot of challenges with what could be up there. There could be illegal uh, modifications to make it a living space. So let's talk attic <laughs> fires. Whether trying to figure out if the basement fire made it to the attic because it's balloon construction or we're alerted for, in my case, last week for my department, an actual attic fire. Where do we start? Hmm. Uh, Bob Preston and I talked about attic fires, wind-driven attic fires. You know, again, we mentioned the direction of the wind a little bit ago uh, on one of our senior man show presentations. And that was, uh, I think, I think uh, something that we don't really think of. You know, funny thing about firefighters, and again, we go back to UL and NIST and so forth and all these things that they're telling us, you know, we got to change this, we got to look at that, we got to consider this and that. Yeah, 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 we know. One of the things that firefighters have always done, if we're going to do any good, aggressive interior firefighting, we're going to operate in a flow path. It's just that simple. The fire's down the hallway. We're going down that hallway with the hose line to kill the fire. Well, the door is open behind us, and that fire is going to reach for that oxygen. It's going to be the flow path. And that's the whole thing about ventilation and truck work to complement engine work. That's the other reason why having that nozzle ready to go and take control of that hallway. So if that fire comes out of that room, then we're going to beat it down, kill it, and we're going to move that nozzle down there and finish off the fire. So we're going to always operate in a flow path at some point or time. So this fire that we were talking about, uh, 
it was uh, an attic in a side-by-side, two-family residential side-by-side, older building. The only way to get to the attic was from a rear stairway up the rear of the structure, a common stairway going up to this attic. Remember, you're talking a totally wood structure, old, so as you said earlier, don't know what's in it, so forth. Good fire sh- breaking the front windows before arrival. So you got a good body of fire up there. The line goes inside, it goes up to that rear stairwell. Do you take that window? Or if you just open the door and go up there and fight the fire? What happens if you don't take that window and you just open that door to the attic from the rear and the wind's blowing from the front of the structure? What have you just created? Flow oh, pass. Absolutely. And a very dangerous flow path for that. And that's the whole thing about understanding it because we're going to have to operate in it. Okay. And Bob brought out another way to attack a fire like that. You bring the line into second floor because this is a two, two story, you know, uh, two family. And you go to the ceilings. And come out about a foot from the wall, a foot or two foot from the wall. Take your pipe poles and start jamming them up there and opening up the ceiling and now getting your stream up there. Because you just might be operating in a, in a blowtorch. Okay? I don't mm-hmm. care how good our turnout gear is. And that's where we, you know, where we let people believe that, yeah, I got my suit of armor on. I can go through anything. No, you can't. Okay? So maybe it's best to do like like Presser was talking about, go to the outer parts of the the uh, ceiling, start punching the holes, pulling the ceilings, not only here, but on the other side of the structure, which is going to require a couple of hose lines up there because you got to be mobile. You just can't take a hose line on a side by side from one unit to another because fire is going to regenerate in that time right. and then burn right. the roof off. And that's the coordination once again. Yeah. So it, it 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 can be, you know, and that's why I always I don't like when somebody sees a fire on YouTube or sees it on the news or Facebook or whatever, and they start criticizing a fire department, you know, for what they do. You don't know their conditions. You don't know the circumstances they're confronted with. Right. You don't know the building. You don't know the type of construction. Like you said, everybody throws their junk up in the attic. You know? Yeah, right. And so this is what makes it a fire like that very, very complex. <laughs> so, yeah. and it's a multi-line fire, and it's got to be coordinated somehow. Right. You know, I'm gonna, uh, yeah, I'm gonna delve deep, uh, briefly into what you just said, even though it's not about engine work. But I've talked about it on this show before, and it's a big part of my a presentation now and that's the 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 keyboard warriors out there and we've we've just got to get it to stop i mean we all you know anyone listening to this show and anyone worth their salt in the fire service is really into the fire service and reads about the fire service and watches those videos and and thinks to themselves how we would maybe how their department would operate which is fine yeah but to take to the keyboard and criticize the brothers and sisters is goes against everything we stand for in this fire service. We love the brotherhood and sisterhood. We love the Maltese cross. Hey, brother. Hey, sister. But then we'll see something that we don't agree with. Or maybe the department did have a bad day. We've all had bad days. Maybe they did make a mistake. But to take to the keyboard and crucify them is anything but professional. And we've got to get the word out to the members of our organizations to refrain from that. What do they call that? Where you want to look at yeah, look up a person's background who's making those ac- accusations to see where they're from and you know what their what their background is. Right, right. You know? It's yeah. just, and even if they did something wrong, learn from it. Talk about it in house. Hey, what would we have done different? How does our SOP SOG yeah. apply here? But don't go attacking other fire departments and firefighters on social media. It's just it's childish. And it's it's not professional. No, it's ridiculous. Right. So, yeah. um, so I had to say that. I definitely had to say that. But yeah. uh, you know, the other thing with with Andy or with um, I'm sorry, with um, Bob, Bob Pressler's idea there, 
I think about like in my attic, if you pulled the ceiling down below my attic, you're immediately going to hit plywood because <laughs> it's all finished off for storage. So there's so many challenges yeah. with attics. Absolutely. Well, see, that's where somebody, you now you got to go to the roof. Right. Or on horizontal ventilation. Otherwise, yeah, this idea, roof. here's one for you. How about pulling out the old 1960s piercing nozzle and punching that through the plywood to at least try? I've heard a million different ideas, right? right you right. can. I've heard piercing nozzles nozzles being worked from the roof side too. We had. Uh, I got you, you. You 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 jogged my memory too about a fire we had on a winter day in a vacant house. Okay, and much like any old industrialized city, you had the shotgun houses. You know, long. Slender, narrow, two stories in the front, one and a half stories in the rear. Now, uh, they got this place going, so we got the line inside. And we're hitting the fire. And, of course, the smoke, the steam, and everything. And, again, winter day, the place is open. And those pull-down stairs that you mentioned. Yes. They got the springs. Mm -hmm. And you know where I'm going with this. You got a good fire overhead causing those uh, springs to lose their tension. Next thing we knew, the stairs unfolding down on top of us. And it, it actually knocked, knocked one of our guys out of the out of, out of the work for the rest of the night because he wow. got a shoulder injury from it. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, and that's something that comes through the smoke and the steam. You go and see it, and the next thing you know, bam. You know? Right. So, yeah, you don't expect them. But, uh, and that was in an older house. Newer houses, you see a lot of that stuff going in. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. I've known companies, their SOG was not to use those stairs. Maybe right away no, they not. do it, but I've heard where they've made the attic opening bigger and bring an attic ladder in and work off the attic ladder. Just we talked about a little bit ago about certain tools, certain equipment that should go in like in the past. Why aren't we doing that anymore? Yeah. So what about that mentality? So very good. Yeah, yeah. Attic fires are tough. Um, there's so many, like I said, you know, they could be finished, unfinished. There's so much junk up there. Insulation. How about blown in insulation? Do you ever pull the ceiling and all that's pouring on you? Oh my god. Yep. So but you gotta get in, you gotta be aggressive, gotta be coordinated. You know, um, I had an attic fire when I was chief of the department and um the homeowner met me on the front lawn, and before my engine got there, I was able to ask him. Well, first of all, I made sure everyone was out, which they were, but then I asked, how do you get to the attic? And he was able to tell me exactly where the attic scuttle was so I could pass that information on, and my crews knew yeah. exact. And in some cases, as in this case, the house is clear, right? If it's just oh, yeah. contained in the attic, it's clear. Everything's above you. At yeah, that point, at, at that, that point. point, yes. Don't get <laughs> yeah. Now, okay, so we're talking. You know, I, I I think we're talking pretty much right now of the attic. That's the storage space. Another one that I, uh, I I, th I think creates a even more. Oh, I don't know. A, a very complex scenario is the finished attic, a big attic where you have a living space up there or you have a bedroom or a couple of bedrooms up there, you know, like, you know, very, very large two and a half story frame structure. Yeah. We, back here, we call them, that's a three story job, you know, because yeah. you have a whole third floor, you know, where the kids, you know, that was their playroom. That was their bedrooms. That was their TV room. You know, the rest of the house, you know, was the two floors below and so forth. You get fired in the knee walls and man, you get yourself a real problem. I had a note here to bring up knee walls, so I'm glad you're talking about it. That, to me, you know, I, 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 uh, I, I'm I, sure, like I have mentioned before, many firemen have their stories about, you know, something like that. You crawl in, and you're feeling a knee wall, and next thing you know, something's roaring out at you, and, and it surprises you, shocks you, whatever. The other one is you crawl along, you're feeling the knee wall, and this is where somebody you want to have that line. When you have a black, hot, and so forth, look, it's coming right down on you. And you reach into the knee wall, but that's where the floor ends right there. And if you you're going down like that. And it was it was it was a real shock, you know, because there was no floor in that knee wall area. 
Just oh, there was no floor on the other floor. side of the knee wall? Uh-uh. Ah. Yeah. A lot of people so, use that for storage and stuff. So. I know. Yeah, and see, that's up to the homeowner if he wants to put plywood, like in your case, or yeah. sixes down, or they just throw it in there. Yeah. So. Yeah, knee walls are something to be aware of. Circumstantial, once again. Yeah. yeah. And that's where rooftop ventilation call comes in. Yeah. Because if it's in the knee walls, and you have a finished ceiling. That means a fire, if it's in the knee wall, can burn up the outside walls into the roof space and into like a cock loft or in a uh, small uh, rafter space. Sure, the void space. Run end to end. Yeah, it can run end to end. Yeah. So again, uh, again, this isn't a class on truck work and so forth, but you know, I remember many, many years ago, we basic training. When you cut a roof, especially a roof like that, you cut it so the hole is six inches below the ridge board because you want to get that space to vent out overhead. Ah. Okay. Draw the fire up and up. You know, the guys who want to cut holes in roofs down close to the gutter line or something like that, that's no good. Okay. You're not even drawing the fire up. You're not pulling any of the heat or smoke out. Go up to the ridge, come down a couple inches, you know, and then make your hole there. So you can see about three rafters, as one of our truck guys used to tell me. He said, No, we're going to see three rafters. Yeah. Makes sense. There's some truck some truck tidbits for all you truckies <laughs> out there. <laughs> uh, Anything else here. on attic fires? I guess the thing with the attic uh -huh. fires is try and figure out how you're going to get up in the attic, coordinate yeah. the ventilation. Yeah. Stretch yeah. the line. Yeah, and uh, be prepared for anything because anything can be up there. The kitchen sink could be up there. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Hey, I just want to take a minute and remind the listeners that they are listening to Fire Engineering Talk Radio and this episode of the Professional Volunteer Fire Department. Tom Merrill here and glad to have you listening in and joining me is retired Cleveland firefighter Jeff Shoup. And we again are talking about engine company operations and um Today, we're focusing on some uh, different types of fire scenarios, garage, basement, attic. Um, we just want to concentrate on some of the basic things we should be doing because I said this on the last episode. I think it's safe to say that out of nearly 30,000 fire departments that are in the United States, 99.99% uh, of them have at least one vehicle parked in their apparatus bay that is designed to put water on the fire and probably has some hose on it as well. So we need to take the time to train properly and be prepared properly for what type of fires we may find in our area. And I'm pretty sure everyone has residential houses in their area, and we've been really focusing on that. And I'd like to delve into... And this might be a good place to finish up this episode because we concentrate on residential type fire tactics. But we haven't talked about the bread and butter residential fire and line placement and the three positions on that line. The nozzle firefighter, the backup firefighter, and the door con or the um, control firefighter. So um, I saw that there's great video that you have on that on Brass Tacks and Hard Facts video series. But I thought we could... Just talk quickly about the initial stretch and maybe some hiccups you've seen with that. Uh, last episode, we talked about keeping your hose lays or your hose packing simple. Um, do we stretch to the burn side or the unburn side? And so let's talk about that, if we could, Jeff, about stretching the line, um, where the line's going to go, and then we'll talk about the firefighter positions on that line. How does that sound? All right. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. And again, this is another one of those things that I think some people are looking for a black and white uh, rule to apply. And that is always take your nozzle to the unburned side. And I always ask people, have you ever tried to follow that? Yeah. Uh, have you ever taken the nozzle, which, for example, you pull up to a house and you got a good fire in the first floor and windows are orange and so forth like that in the front rooms? Have you ever taken your nozzle around to the back side of the house and found a door 
that you thought you were going to make entry in from the unburned side and found it black, hot, right down to the floor, and you can't see a thing. And how is that going to get you to the fire in the front? So what's the best thing to do? The fire is working away. It's creating a horrible situation. It's destroying this building. Let's get water in the fire quickly. If it's a two-story frame house, where are the steps to the second floor generally located? Right. Generally so right across the front from the door. front door. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if we can pull up and we recognize this situation, uh, probably hitting the fire head on is what we need to do. And get inside that fire and you just play that nozzle away. Just like if there was a whole bunch of sprinkler heads in there, what would they be doing at that point? They would be working away. So let's take that nozzle and work that whole area. And then you're going to rely on the nozzle stream and the reach and the volume to do the work for you. If right. you are two stories. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, I was just say not to mention you 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 the you stretch the unburned side. You want to go around the back of the house. You, you don't know what obstacles are back there, cars, trees, things. You might not have enough hose. How much hose are you going to need? Yeah. You know, and it's delaying getting water on the fire. Exactly. Um, if, exactly. if there's victims to be found, there's a good chance their their victims are going to run toward where they always come in and out of the house. So there's a good chance they're going to be right there near the front door. So you're right. Get in that front door quickly and get water on the fire. Start jumping the water. The other thing about uh, that that nozzle. Look, if we're if it's our intent to make it an interior fire attack, which it should be until we until proven otherwise inch and three quarter 15 16 or once again like we said earlier uh 175 gallons a minute for a fog nozzle for a low pressure fog nozzle but you get in there and you hold that position and listen to the stream and the noise it makes as it's hitting the walls and the ceiling as the nozzle the person on the nozzle working it around you hear a void space you're like and all of a sudden it stops, that's probably the opening to the second floor, the stairway. So hold that stream there so water gets up there. Because if anybody's stuck upstairs, if anybody's trapped upstairs unconscious, uh, you want to take control of that point. Start flowing the water up there. Right. The other thing is I got a picture of a fire that I always put out there, a fire that we were at. We had three rooms. Uh, fire showing three sides of the house when we arrived. We pulled an inch and three quarter, 15 sixteenths, and we got the fire knocked down. And this was within two minutes of arrival. This is a good fire. But the one show uh, picture I show is a firefighter. You see his reflective uh, uh, sleeve above in the second floor. So when uh, you have that fire and that nozzle is making entry. You hold that position. You flow that stream. Don't be afraid of water damage, okay? Because you probably have firefighters doing VES, uh, making entry to other, depart uh, other parts of the, the uh, structure. Maybe even came in behind you, you know? Yeah. After the nozzle, after the fire was knocked down, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Those are the things that, you know, why we hold our position with that attack line and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. The... Okay, great. Okay, so, and again, you mentioned earlier, let's talk about the average fire crew of three people stretching that line. Um, I think I have the positions right, right? You have a nozzle firefighter. You have the backup firefighter. You have the control firefighter. What uh, what words of wisdom does Jeff like to teach and pass on as he does training and things that can make the stretch go smooth and, and make the operation go smoother? Let's start with, well, the what, the nozzle firefighter, right? Right, right. Uh, I'm trying to think of the uh, our brass tacks and hard facts videos that we put together. What that was doing was giving everybody a sense of the different positions that can be found on a hose line. 
So you have the person in the nozzle, and this is where nozzle mechanics come in. And this is also where uh, things like proper nozzle pressure, positioning of the, and, uh, oh gosh, you know, open the bale, full flow, and let it rip in front of you. Getting the nozzle out in front of you. Right, right. And before he does that, though, like when they stretch the line, do you yeah. think it's important that the nozzle firefighter makes sure he's got enough uh, that the line is bled properly and the proper pressure before he enters the fire area, before he even goes into the residential house? Well, if you take a look at what we talked about in the last episode about hose loads, again, I come from a department where there's no pre-connected hose lines. Right. Attack loan, your, your attack hose loads, the last 50 feet is coiled with the nozzle. So the person in the nozzle takes the working length, that's what we call it, with the nozzle to the drop point, flakes it out, makes the call for water. And the person who should be right there with them, and this person is going to be acting as the backup, should be the company officer. Company officer is not supposed to be doing laps around the building at that point. They're supposed to be right there with that person on the nozzle to make sure everything's going to go when that call for water is made. The line is going to be straightened out. The line is going to be bled off. We're going to be moving in on air together. We don't want somebody stepping out of the cab with their face piece on, using their air in fresh air, okay? We don't want somebody putting their face piece on halfway across the parking lot or the street. We want to go on air together as a crew when we start making that attack. So that's uh, a couple of basics right there. You know, I want to just harp on that. I want to reinforce that because working at the fire alarm office, sometimes I will hear people talking on the radio and you can tell they have their mask on and they may not be on air yet. Although I have heard people on air in the cab, which is, is it shouldn't be, but even with your mask on, you're giving yourself tunnel vision. I oh, firmly absolutely. believe don't mask up until you're at that drop point and you mask up with your crew together. You go on air together. Do not waste air in the <laughs> cab or even walking around outside as you're stretching the line. Mm -hmm. Kneel down together and go on air together. Right, Jeff? That's absolutely correct. Now, the only reason I can see you having your face piece on in the cab is if your engine has a bad exhaust system. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> right. No. Okay. All right. Yeah, we go to the drop point. We want to. Where's use the drop point? What do you recommend? The drop point. Drop point. Okay. The, uh, the person on the nozzle's got the nozzle of fifty feet of hose. The drop point is that location as close to the fire as we can get, and yet put the hose in service. Now, in other words, get it all uh, flaked out, charged, bled off. We give it a final look, see about what what it is, what we got, where we're going. And we're on air together and we're moving in that way. Right. And most likely outside the house for yeah, residential yeah. fire and butter fire. If, if it's a second floor fire and we have a long stairway, the person on the nozzle can probably take the nozzle halfway up the stairs. As long as he doesn't have to have, uh, have to worry about anything dropping down. If not, we'll just go to the base of the stair, stretch the rest of the hose out of the structure because we want to keep the hose in a straight line, right? Just like we talked about before, right. bleed it off there. We go on air together and up we go. Now, some firefighters are anti uh, testing the pattern or testing the making sure they bleed the line, but it's important to bleed the line and not just give it a two second uh, squirt, right? You really got to yeah. take your time. You're, you're not, you might lose a little water, but it's important to make sure you've got the good operating pressure and the right pattern right especially you're using a fog and you need to be on a straight stream right. uh, it's you better make sure before you go into harm's way some of these things get out of control oh you're get, you're losing water you're losing water no you're not losing water okay the air is compressed to the nozzle by the water coming okay so one thousand two thousand three thousand what i use nine gallons maybe <laughs> maybe 
you know, something like that. So, no, that's that's one of those things that, you know, when you have people try to scare you and they're thinking their way or whatever. You know. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, the door control. we got three people on an engine. So, right now we have a firefighter in the nozzle. The officer should be right behind him and in the area of the nozzle to make sure that the nozzle is doing its job, getting to the seat of the fire. The nozzle, you might have a young firefighter in that nozzle. Okay, but that's those two people right there. That's your attack crew. The third position is the door control. And when you have three people on an engine, that's your pump operator. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. You've got to do double duty. uh, When you've only got three people on an apparatus and you're making the attack and you're stretching that line in, you want to move it in. That's up to that pump operator to keep that line so it can play into the fire area when they call for more line. And little simple tricks like, you know, you, like I've heard somebody say, put a little bend in the line. And when, a, you know, those guys move in uh, and, the, and the bend is gone, well, then just give it again. That means they took a couple feet of hose in with them. Okay. They're moving in and so forth. But again, here, take a look at the building you're, you're, you're working in. Are you working in a ranch house? Well, how much hose do they need? Just keep the line going straight. Once again, hose line management, and you'll avoid any kinks for those guys. Don't right. throw a whole bunch of hose in there. And pump operators, you are really hustling. When right. we do our engine class and we run into the scenarios, at the end of the day, we, we do those scenarios. Those pump operators, we always tell them, you better have your running shoes on because this is what's expected of you, okay? You yeah. got to get the line going. You got to get this going. You got to get this going and so forth. They're like, oh, my gosh, you know. Yeah. And then they see what we're talking about, and they see the value of their position. And Jeff Shoup is not a fan of piling hose in a foyer or hallway, are you? Absolutely not. Yeah. Absolutely not. Whether you're the backup firefighter or the door control firefighter, don't overdo it. Don't push, right? No. Feed hose as it's needed, correct? Picture yourself in a hot, smoky, zero visibility environment, and everybody behind you is now trying to push more hose at you. Right. You're they're knocking you over. <laughs> yeah. Or they're going to kinks. Push, they'll push the nozzle right out of your hands. Yeah. And they'll create more kinks, too. Yeah, absolutely. That's the thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Does, does the nozzle firefighter, this is a discussion that is often had amongst the crews, is the nozzle that the nozzle firefighter is the nozzle his or her tool? Like, are they? I've seen firefighters advancing hose lines, carrying a halligan, carrying an axe, and they're trying to do it all. I always thought that if you're the nozzle firefighter, that nozzle's your tool. That's absolutely correct. Because if you don't control the nozzle, who does? Right. I'll give an example of what happened one time at a fire years ago. And you remember we were talking about that third floor, that finished third floor? Yes. Okay. With the sloping ceilings and the knee walls and stuff like that. So the fire was knocked out and it was a good fire. Yeah. And I mean, a really good fire. And the last thing that was done with that nozzle, guys went over to the window and performed hydraulic ventilation with the fog tip. Well, looks like the fire's down, uh, knocked down. The room's cleared out and so forth. And it's, Big, big, you know, big area. And guys are going to go take their tanks off, and some guys are just going to, you know, okay, fine, let's just see what happens here. Next thing you knew, the ceiling started turning black that fast. In other words, the fire, it was in the walls. It hadn't been found. When you use a fog nozzle out a window, you create currents of air because that fog nozzle has a low pressure point. So inside the structure, pushing that environment out, you draw wind through the stairwells, through the void spaces and things like that. And this fire was getting fanned. Next thing you knew, the room went black. Mm. The nozzle had been laid down by the person on the nozzle. And guys are scurrying now. You know, remember, they had their masks off, and now all of a sudden the, the situation goes untenable. Guy grabs a nozzle, opens up the nozzle, because here comes the fire, 
And the last thing that was done with that nozzle was that they had it out the window, well, in a wide angle fog. Oh. And you know where the, we're going with this. And next thing you knew, that fire was just sucked right down on the crew. And wow. that's the whole thing about when you're in a nozzle, you stay in the nozzle. That nozzle's your tool. You know what you're doing with it. If you're gonna pull, if you're gonna grab a tool and want to go uh, open up the walls of the ceiling, go to a truck or a squad. We tell people. <laughs> uh, so we yeah. got the nozzle firefighter who grabs the nozzle in the working length, goes to the drop point, drops it, gets it stretched to the door bleeds the line, make sure the operating pressure is correct. Don't just do a pop top bleed. You've got to open and flow for 10 seconds or so. Make sure if it's a fog nozzle you're using, make sure it's on a straight stream pattern, right? Make sure the right. pressure is good. Uh, make sure that the line, the line is behind you is in a straight line, as straight as possible. Um, the backup firefighter, you're there to support the firefighter and the nozzle firefighter could be the officer, most likely will be. Don't push, only feed line as needed. Um, the door firefighter oftentimes might be the engine chauffeur if it's a three-person crew. Let's say now we are lucky and it's we're talking volunteers here for this show. Volunteers are showing up now. We can assign a volunteer. Hey, you're the door firefighter. But again... Just feed line as needed. That oh, right. have good communication. Do not force the line on those firefighters in front of you. Yep. Right. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. And I think Jeff, we will finish this episode there. That's we great. talked about you know uh, the basic stretch for the bread and butter fire. We talked about garage fire. We talked about attic fires. We talked about basement fires and a lot of tidbits of information sprinkled in between all of those scenarios as well. How about next time we maybe talk about some commercial fires in the two and a half inch line? Yeah. And another line I think we should uh, bring into the mix is the two inch line. The two inch. Yeah. They've done a lot of work with that. And it's a line that's been around for a long time. And with the improvements in the manufacture of fire hose, the two inch line, inch and a half couplings, and the one and one sixteenth inch tip or the 250 gallon minute fog tip, low pressure system. I think it's one of those things that, especially for your three three member company, the weight of the water and the hose line and so forth, we'll discuss. And uh, I think you'll find uh, this is really something we, we, present it and we work with it everywhere we go okay yeah it's, well it's, there's a little there's a little advertisement for episode <laughs> number three with jeff shoop then and uh, i think that's great and um i i hope that our listeners i know they got to be getting a lot of good information out of this because i've taken several uh a couple pages of notes here so if people had questions for you jeff and wanted to talk to you more about their situation back home or have questions that I didn't think to ask you, how can they get a hold of you? Uh, you can call me on my, should I give my cell phone out? Sure. Whatever you want. So you, yeah. you can do whatever you want. Yeah. Okay. I'll give you uh, two ways. It's usually on my card anyhow. So 216-470-4117. That's cell. And email is hjs0552 at gmail.com. And that's Excellent. lowercase. Yeah, lowercase. And it's H. Henry J. John S. Sam. How about Hayden Jeffrey Shoop? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so we got some good topics. Keep it simple. <laughs> yes. We got some good topics to talk about coming up. You know, the other yeah. thing I wanted to talk about too, and maybe we'll have an episode four, but I'd like to get into some common engine emergencies. Yeah. Air overhead, loss of water, extending the line. So, you know, so we will talk more. You can do the, that. As the year rolls on here, I appreciate your time. Thank oh, you very much again for another very good episode. 
And folks, thanks for listening in. If anyone wants to get a hold of me, as I said at the beginning, I love when you reach out to me. I love when you give me feedback or offer suggestions on who, uh, what we can talk about or some guests. I've had people recommend guests. Again, my email, T.A. Merrill. It's M-E-R-R-I-L-L, followed by the number 63 at AOL.com. T.A. Merrill, 63 at AOL.com. Please uh, check out my Professional Volunteer Fire Department Facebook page and give it a like. I'm always posting information on there, topics of interest, uh, motivational sayings, links to articles, things like that. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. And also I have my website, theprofessionalvolunteerfiredepartment.com or thepvfd.com. Both those will take you right to my website where you can see links to my articles, my podcast, the different presentations that I offer and uh, upcoming events that I'm going to be at. So uh, thanks for listening in. My next show will be Tuesday, July 25th. Again, Jeff will be on to talk about engine operations part three. And that'll be commercial building fires, two and a half inch hose, the two inch hand line. And maybe if we have time, we'll get into engine emergencies. So thanks for tuning in. Please stay safe. And remember, folks, that true professionalism is not defined by a paycheck. And your residents are owed professional service delivered by professional firefighters representing a professional organization. Thank you.